President-elect Donald Trump not happy with the United Nations for condemning our ally Israel and not happy with the Obama administration for letting it happen. Well, now some Republican lawmakers calling for the U.S. to cut off U.S. funding to the United Nations, should we? Hi, everybody, and Happy New Year. I'm David Asin. Welcome to Forbes on Fox. Let's go in focus to find out with Steve Forbes, Sabrina Schaefer, Bill Baldwin, John Tamney, and Bruce Jackson. So, Steve, we're going to deal with the U.S. role in all this in a moment, but should this be the last straw for the U.N.? Doesn't it do more harm to the U.S. and allies than good? Well, this is a perfect opportunity to throw down the marker. We've withdrawn from organizations like UNESCO, which is part of the uh, UN in the past. We should withdraw from various other organizations in the UN that wouldn't have any treaty violations. And we've got to send the message out there. We're not going to be a patsy for these things in the future. And by the way, just for the record, part of the UN is the International Monetary Fund, another subject for another time, but also a destructive organization. Yeah. We shouldn't be using taxpayer dollars to undermine our own interests. All right, Bruce, let's talk money for a second here. We spend $3 billion a year on the United Nations. The U.S. does. That's a big part of its budget. I think about a quarter of its budget, maybe a little less. But then there are the voluntary contributions. The last time we demanded to know how much that was from the U.S. was in 2010. $7.69 billion, not insignificant. Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing an audit and if Congress wants to come in and examine how we're spending our money. But let's look at this. The U.N. does a lot of good in the areas of health care, and we have a lot of disease outbreaks, Zika virus, Ebola virus. They have aid workers. They have infrastructure. Uh, we need, we can't just go isolationist when it comes to global diseases or they will start knocking on our door. John, do we need, as Bruce says, the U.N.? I don't think we need the U.N., and I would love to see President-elect Trump defund that which doesn't have our best interest in mind, but he can't do that. And so what I think the better answer is, is just to not appoint a new U.N. head. If, if suddenly the U.S. is not particip participating in the U.N., it has no legitimacy, and so I think that's the yeah. quickest way to shrink it down to size. And, Bill, frankly, I live in New York City, where the U.N. is based. Uh, they get away with all kinds of, they don't pay their parking tickets. These guys are are just out for a good lunch, aren't they? Yes, I have to agree with you. The UN is a haven for Israel bashers. It's a big waster of money, and they don't pay their parking tickets. It's bad, but don't defund it. It's our last best chance to sit down with enemies before we go to war. I don't think we should give it up. I don't know. Sabrina, you actually worked with the U.S. ambassador in the UN, Jean Kirkpatrick. She sort of reminds me of John Bolton. She was really strong against the bad stuff they do. Yeah, but I think that she would sympathize with Trump's you know, claim that they have the potential to do good. But I think we have to be very, very honest about what's really happening there. And as, as you mentioned, she wrote nearly 30 years ago that the U.N. had become a vehicle for legitimatizing the PLO. And today, you know, the actors may have changed, but the set remains the same. And, and they are still a vehicle for you know, delegitimizing Israel and sort of yeah. standing up against this idea that it could be a sovereign Jewish state. And I think that's a huge problem as they are a leading ally for it. So and, and we definitely need to stand up. Steve, what's worse is when the U.S. starts talking like the U.N., which is what happened this week. We had our Secretary of State, John Kerry, uh, coming out with a long, it was almost two hours, a diatribe. He did mention some bad stuff that the, uh, the Palestinians do, but primarily it was a hit on Israel. Let's just play a little sample of what he said. The Israeli Prime Minister publicly supports a two-state solution, but his current coalition is the most right-wing in Israeli history with an agenda driven by the most extreme elements. Well, what Kerry said, Steve, uh, led Donald Trump to tweet, as he normally does. Uh, he says, we cannot continue to let Israel be treated with such total disdain and disrespect. They used to have a great friend in the U.S., but not anymore. The beginning of the end was the horrible Iran deal, and now this, the U.N., stay strong Israel, January 20th, is fast approaching. Well, I think that underscores that what happened in the U.N. for once wasn't a U.N. instigated thing, but a U.S. instigated thing. Uh, Barack Obama's had it in for Israel from the beginning. Now that he's gone out of office, he's just letting vent his anti-Israeli sentiments. Uh, John Kerry, empty suit, just goes along with what he's fed by the State Department bureaucracy, which believes in this two-state solution. David, remember, Gaza got withdrawal of Israeli settlements a decade ago. It's now become a haven for terrorism yeah. and warfare and missiles going into Israel. No so we've tried 
uh, the anti-settlement thing. And by the way, I'm going to be blunt here. Anti-settlement means Jew-free. We should learn from World War II. We should not tolerate that anywhere in the world. Well, and frankly, Bruce, what happened in 2005 when, when Israel uh, pulled out of Gaza, they pulled all their settlements out of Gaza, what happened? Ha Hamas came in, other terrorist organizations, and began lobbing missiles right into Israel. Well, and this idea that President Obama doesn't support Israel is ridiculous. He signed a... A, their, the funding to defend them, as it was, what was this, 10 years, U.S. tax dollars, what is it, $38 billion, the United States? It wasn't George Bush who signed that. It, wasn't, uh, it won't be Donald Trump. It was Barack Obama who signed the legislation but, to protect Israel. Okay, Sabrina, I heard you wanted to get in, but before I let you go, let me just, it's not just U.S. people who are suggesting that uh, this administration is anti-Israel. The, the U.K., the Prime Minister of the U.K., Theresa May, uh, said that uh, she doesn't believe that it's appropriate to attack the composition of the democratically elected government of an ally. So it's not just folks here saying that. Yeah, and I'm sure that they're concerned about their, you know, being attacked as well. Look, I, I think that this is one of those instances where we can say that words matter. And we've been saying that a lot about the president-elect Trump. But this is exactly the same thing for John Kerry. He used words like radical extremists when talking about one of our major allies and talking about a country that is surrounded by actual terrorists, actual extremists. So I think we need to be very careful on both sides of the political aisle about how we speak about many for, foreign and right. domestic affairs. And Bill, it's... Obviously, the Trump administration is going to have a very different view of Israel. They, they announced that with the, the nomination for the, the ambassador to Israel, who's, who's very supportive of the government there. However, we just get an idea of how bad the U.N. is when we see it sort of mocked or parodied in the U.S. Well, uh, I'm glad that the new administration is a lot more supportive of Israel. But I've got a question for Steve. Just how many international fights do you want the new president to pick in order to prove himself? All right, Steve. Pick fights. Uh, Donald Trump did not invade Ukraine. Donald Trump did not invade Crimea. Donald Trump did not uh, do that drone business in the Pacific Ocean, committing aggression in the South China Sea. Donald Trump did not blow up the Middle East. Donald Trump did not withdraw troops for political reasons from Iraq and let ISIS mm -hmm. rise and run amok. So picking fights, the world's picking fights with the good guys. We've got to fight back. John, uh, let me just mention something out of the past, because not too many people fully defending the U.N. here. In the early 1990s, uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait. The UN put together a coalition. Uh, George Bush the first was involved in that, getting the UN to eventually kick Saddam out of Kuwait. Uh, that was a good thing, right? Well, I wonder, um, it, does Kuwait have our best interests in mind? That's I question this notion that we owe the rest of the world their freedom. I think I, there's a good argument that the world is a less safe place, place precisely because the U.S. is the protector of the free world. What I like about Trump is to some degree he is saying it's not the U.S.'s job to right. fund the defense of some of the richest countries on earth. That's not our job. Bruce, let me challenge you for a second. Other than UNESCO, and, and there are some charity wars works that the UN does, which is a pretty good thing. What do they do that, that helps us be more secure as a nation? Well, if you go back to what you talked about with under George Bush, I mean, if, if it is a body that at least you can find out where other countries are standing and it puts people on record, if it goes away, we have no, as Bill said earlier, way to promote peace around the world and, and work with our, our allies. Now, if you don't want it to be in New York or if you want it, this all to be okay. done by email, I guess that's for the next administration quick, quick to tweet about. Quick last word from Steve. Uh, if the U.S. is not active in the world, we get a replay of the 1930s when we nearly lost civilization. We have to be active. We make mistakes. But when we withdraw, we see what's happening in the world today becomes more unsafe and eventually comes right, out, right up to our shores.